Javier, can you read more live? All right. You all hear me okay? I figured. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. All right. So a really quick uh, check. Uh, Gabe, do we have folks on the on the Zoom? Okay, fantastic. Roughly how many people, just so I have a good sense? Counting. Four and counting. All right. For those of you on Zoom, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Javier Hernandez. I am the Director of Innovation and Communications for the City of Pico Rivera, and I'm going to be doing your presentation for this evening. So we're going to be talking about a couple of really fun, exciting um, initiatives that the city is undertaking, really dedicated to the future of Pico Rivera. Right, there's a lot going on, as you know, on the roads today. Right, a lot of work that's currently taking place. Do you guys need some help over there? It's just a little hard to focus here. <laughs> Oh, no worries. Yeah, but you guys want to step outside and give them a call right back? Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, no, understood. Understood. Uh, yeah, well, it's on uh, YouTube. It's on the Virtual City Hall through the YouTube uh, channel. You guys can get on there. Um, okay, so I, I was saying, so we... Um, We've been developing a program here in the city of Pico Rivera. It's known, uh, known as Pico Rivera 2035, uh, the Community Revitalization Program, very comprehensive citywide program. So we're going to give you a quick overview of what, what that is, why we did it, and then what we're doing now with regard to that citywide program. All right, so let me just get through this a little bit. I'm going to be turning around here because I can't really see the screen that well from where I'm at. How about that? I don't want to give you guys my back either. Um, all right, cool. So before I get started, any questions, suggestions, ideas, comments? I know some of you have seen this presentation before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're actually in the process of, uh, of assigning it a different name. Yeah, we're in the process of doing that, mainly because um, we do know that the plans that we're developing are really for like the next 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years out. And so we don't want to necessarily, you know, give it at that 30, 20, 35 time frame. We did that at the very beginning. We just kind of ran with it. Um, it worked at the beginning, but it's now that it's kind of evolved and has grown, we're now rethinking the name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You. you got it. All right, so let me get through this presentation here. Uh, Gabe, any way to move that top? There you go. Thank you. All right, so let me just get through um, the first couple of slides. I want to make sure that you guys understand exactly why we developed this program. So first and foremost, I mean, everybody knows exactly what happened in March of 2020. COVID-19 was a massive, massive shift in how we as humans interact, right? Uh, it changed everything, uh, how we operate as an organization, how we interact at home with our respective families, everything about uh, the way we live life changed. Um, so I won't get too far into the details. Everyone's very familiar with that. You also are probably very familiar with what happened as a result of COVID-19 with regard to the economy. Everything tanked, right? Uh, gas prices went up, skyrocketed. We saw the most historic um, gas prices we've ever seen. We have seen the most instability in the stock market. Um, housing prices, uh, shopping behavior, um, layoffs in, you know, across ma many different industries, you name it. We had a massive economic impact associated with COVID-19. Frankly, we're still in it, the economic downturn, right? We're still facing uh, record high inflation. I don't know, are eggs still very expensive? I haven't kind of like stopped buying eggs because they were expensive. <laughs> They're still up there then. Oh, yeah. No, no, of course, of course. 
All right. Well, glad to hear that they're having uh, the chickens are having more eggs. That's good. All right. So then, um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one here because this is what we call unfunded mandates. The state government and the federal government constantly introduce new legislation, new policy that we at the local level are required to implement. Okay. What's interesting about that is they don't give us the money to do it. They just say, hey, you got to build more affordable housing. Okay, give us some money till we can do that. We'll gladly do it, but we can't. We don't have the necessary resources to do that. Hey, we need you to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, reduce your vehicle miles traveled. All these things that they are requiring us to do, but they don't give us money to do it. That puts us in a very difficult situation, right? So we have to be very thoughtful, very strategic, and plan much better than we ever have before, right? About what happens in the next five years, 10 years, et cetera. So it puts us in a situation at the same time we have COVID, we have the economic downturn, we're not getting as much returns with our tax dollars, things like that. And then all on top of all that, we want you to do more. And it's just very, very difficult. So again, unprecedented challenge. But now here's what's interesting. All of these challenges that we have here up on the screen, every single city is facing those challenges, right? No one was able to escape COVID, the economic downturn, and these uh, state and federal mandates. Nobody. But this is where Pico Rivera is even more unique with respect to the challenges that we're facing in this respective community. You guys ever seen this guy right here? That is the Whittier Narrows Dam, right? I'm going to spend more time on this one because the Whittier Narrows Dam, to be frank and honest, is the reason why we have a city. If it wasn't for that dam, this entire area would be filled with water, right? You couldn't develop in this area, right? Be marshy fields, things like that when it rains. So to that extent, we kind of owe a big thank you to the Wader Narrows Dam, right? But a couple of things that I want to highlight about this particular project is the dam is about three miles long, right? And again, it serves as our uh, northern boundary that connects the San Gabriel River on the east to the Rio Hondo on the west, okay? Our northern boundary. Well, the Army Corps of Engineers, who owns the dam, maintains and operates the dam, they've been assessing this dam for quite some time. And they have determined that this dam is at a critical point of failure. Critical point of failure, which means if we have that 500-year storm, this dam can break. Frankly, I'm not sure if you've seen the weather lately, but we're living through some biblical times right now. I really wouldn't rule it out. So needless to say, it's incredibly urgent to fix the dam, right? So to fix the dam, long story short, they got to widen it and they got to elevate it by about six to eight more feet taller, okay? To do that, there are two roads, uh, Lincoln Avenue and Rosemead Boulevard that also need to be elevated, right? Because Rosemead Boulevard, if you've seen and driven on it, it goes up and over the dam, and then it takes you into the Whittier Narrows Recreation Area. Well, when it goes up and over, you're going to have to go up and over six more feet. All right? It has to be elevated along with Lincoln Avenue. Okay? So that's one of the... And so you can only imagine what the traffic impacts are going to be during construction, during the closure of these roadways. Aside from the 605 freeway, those are the only two other roads that go north out of our city. So again, if we're facing a flood and we need to evacuate and it's under construction, that presents a significant challenge, okay? All right. On top of that, 
You guys all familiar with Avenida Vicente Fernandez, recently known as Rooks Road or Sports Arena Drive? Well, that road is being eliminated entirely, and it's not getting replaced as a result of the project. That is the primary access road to get to the sports arena. Okay? Without that road, our good folks in law enforcement, fire department, can't access the sports arena. Without emergency vehicle access, the sports arena will essentially be rendered inoperable for its intended use, right? It is intended for events, special events. Uh, sometimes they host, you know, events with about 7,000, 7,500 7, people. Well, if you can't get emergency vehicles in and out of there, you can't host that kind of a special event anymore. So as a result of that closure of that roadway, we may not be able to operate. We won't be able to operate the sports arena, okay? And that's a permanent closure of that roadway. It's not coming back. On top of that, Bicentennial Park, which is the one all the way to the right-hand side, and then you have the, the uh, Pico Rivera Golf Course right in the middle. That's 30 acres. Streamland Park, that's 14 acres. All of those lands are being eliminated, right? They're being used as the new footprint for the dam. So we're losing as a city. Let me go to the next slide here. A total of 104 acres of parks and open space in the city of Pico Rivera is going to be permanently impacted. That's 57% of all of our parks in the city. That's a lot of park space to lose. You know, I know that a lot of people have and hold the uh, golf course and streamland park close to their heart. Some people go there literally every single day, right? They've been playing there since they were kids. So it's a massive, it's a tragic loss, to be honest with you. But the dam has to get fixed. There is no way around it. So it's one of those things that we call collateral impact, right? Here's what's interesting. Most people don't know this, is that Pico Rivera, even with all that park space, only has 1.3 acres of parks for every 1,000 residents. Okay, the county average is 3.3. The national average is five acres. Most people don't know this. Pico Rivera is park poor, right? And then on top of it, we're going to lose 104 acres of parks. So we're going from being park poor to being park starved. Those are the realities that we're facing here in Pico Rivera. On top of that, we're losing economic activity because of the loss of the sports arena, the golf course, uh, right? Concessions, merchandise sales, rentals, uh, special events, parking, admission, all of those revenues, you know, which essentially make up, you know, a sizable uh, economic activity in our region is being eliminated. On top of that, we're losing upwards of about 250 jobs right, at all of these facilities. We're also, uh, you know, the city incurs costs to participate and collaborate with the Army Corps of Engineers. We're not being reimbursed for any of that. So the time I spend, or any of my other colleagues, on the Whittier Narrows Dam is time we are not spending on other things related to the city, right? And we'll never be reimbursed for any of those expenses and then, of course, there's the typical disruptions that come with uh, any type of major civil infrastructure project, so things like traffic, noise, dust, um, those types of disruptions. Obviously, those are temporary, but disruptions nonetheless. Again, on, it just keeps getting worse, right, the whole situation for Pico Rivera. And so this is what's interesting because a lot of people say, oh, you know, and I can understand, I, I, I myself, you know, experienced anger, frustration. I was upset 
about learning about all this stuff because at the same time that COVID and the economic downturn happened, that's when we learned about the Whittier Narrows Dam. It was like, gosh, we're already like, you know, kick us while you're down, you might as well, you know? And so where most people felt that kind of frustration, we had no choice but to be creative. So we had to look at the positive side. What is the positive side to losing park space like this? What is the positive side to these types of disruptions and impacts? And so one of the things that we looked at is the dam itself and all the impacts, right? So we uh, assessed the impacts and determined that all of those impacts are valued at approximately $125 million over a 30-year period. Hey, good evening. Come on in. So $125 million, right? So that's what we're saying. Hey, all these impacts are valued at $125 million. So we essentially are asking the federal government to say, hey, look, the federal government taketh or giveth, and then the federal government taketh, right? So we're saying, hey, look, we just need a little bit of assistance because this is a really uh, significant loss. But if you go to the federal government and you just put your hand out and say, hey, give us $125 million, what do you think they're going to say? <laughs> Take a hike, right? They want to see how you plan to use $125 million. They're not going to sign a check and hand it over. So that's when we, again, started to see the opportunity for this city, which in our opinion is grand. One of those opportunities is along the rivers. Yes, question? We, we associated that with a 30-year uh, time frame. Um, the rivers, we have the San Gabriel and the Rio Hondo. Those serve as our, for the most part, they serve as our city boundaries, right, on the east and in the west. And at, am I in your way? Do you want to... Do you want to move that way maybe so you can see the screen? Or are you okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, the rivers. So this is where we feel that the rivers present a very unique opportunity to replace parks, open space, recreational opportunities. So we're exploring that. We'll get into more detail on all this stuff in just a bit. We also started to evaluate all of our major corridors in the city. Right, where are we placing uh, significant investments within the community, right? Whether it's at the state, regional, or even at the local level, right? What are the investments being made, and how can we leverage that? I'll touch on more on that in just a bit. Question. Exactly correct. Uh, yeah, great question. We have been making those requests. Um, demands don't fall kindly on the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we have made exactly the request to utilize uh, the roadway on the top of the dam. However, that is reserved specifically for the purpose of maintaining the dam. So they use it as a service road, not a general access collector road. Yeah. So, and they, and mind you, they are not obligated to provide access to the sports arena. Their sole mission is to protect this community from flooding. Nothing else. Everything else is secondary. And if we want, if they want, and they, I mean, they've told us if you want to build a road, you build it with your money. You want more parks and open space? You build it. We're working with them. They're good partners. I'm not going to deny it. They really are good partners, but those realities are just very hard to face. So you have 
very actively involved in advocating on our behalf. Very active. Yep, we are very coordinated in all of our requests. Okay, so the next big thing is, of course, the arterial corridors. So now when you start to evaluate everything kind of comprehensively as an opportunity to establish a framework for economic recovery, that then gave rise to the idea of establishing special districts, right? Pico Rivera does not have an uptown, an old town, a downtown. We don't have anything like that. But we could, and that's where the opportunity arises, okay? Let me get into the detail on some of this stuff in just a bit. And uh, sorry, for those of you on Zoom, uh, I, I can't see the screen, unfortunately, but if you have a question, please uh, ping us in the chats or wave a hand, uh, and we'll make sure that uh, we get to your questions, whatever they may be. And by all means, feel free to submit questions at any point during the presentation. Okay, so let me move, go ahead we and move on. You're monitoring the chats. Excuse me? You are monitoring the chats. Fantastic, thank you. I just wanted it to serve as a reminder that we're, we're monitoring. All right, so one of the things that we as a city said, all right, if we're gonna develop a economic framework, we want it to be grounded in five primary bucket areas, if you will, right? The infrastructure of tomorrow. Development for tomorrow. What does the future workforce look like, right? M developing a modern, smart city, and then of course developing plans for the future of Pico Rivera. That's kind of like was our, our guiding principles, if you will. Now, one thing I wanted to highlight is that we cannot make all the really nice investments above ground, like redoing our medians, introducing really nice new development, you know, paving the streets even, until you do everything below ground, right? We have incredibly old water lines, sewage lines, all of which have to be replaced. So one of the things that we as a city are doing is undertaking a very comprehensive, very methodical process to ensure that if we're gonna fix a line, we don't do it by patch, by patch, by patch. We do it all at once, and we don't have to come back for at least another 20 years to do it again, okay? So very difficult to do. It, doesn't, it might sound easy, but it really requires a lot of thought um, and programming of dollars. Right now, speaking of dollars, we have about $186 million currently at work in the city of Pico Rivera. You go on uh, Whittier Boulevard, you'll see that we are in the process of replacing all the center medians. We've recently been, we've been paving a lot of roads. Obviously, the weather makes it very difficult. Uh, but nevertheless, we are making active, regular progress. Good evening, come on in. I encourage you to join us on this side just so you don't have to dance around my head over but here. But before you do, there is a signing sheet at the table to your, by the door. Please feel free to pick up fact sheets and Thank post you, things. ladies. Thank you so much, and a survey. All right, so $186 million currently at work over the next five years, um, paid for, of course, by city tax dollars. So thank you for that. Um, hope to have better streets and infrastructure, utility infrastructure uh, into the future. All right. So the next thing, when we talk about the rivers, right, I talked a little bit about uh, the rivers serving as an opportunity for replacing parks, open recreation space. We, the city, are looking at every single sliver of land along the rivers to see if there's a way to turn that into some kind of a s open space, recreational opportunity, a park of some kind. We're evaluating every inch along the rivers. And at the same time, we're also looking not just at the river itself, but the river fronts, right? You ever guys ever been to a river promenade, right? Where it's like a lot of exciting, vibrant activity along a river front. So that's basically what we're doing. We're trying to bring the Riviera back to Pico Rivera, right? So that's what we're doing when it comes to the river revitalization program. At the same time, 
Sure, we're doing a lot of master planning, if you will, right? Sometimes it takes several years to do master planning. It takes several years to figure out which projects you want to do now, which projects you want to do in five years and 10 years and so on. But while we do that planning, we're also looking for what we call early action projects. What can we build today? What can we buy today and turn into a park? So we've identified a, a number of different early action projects along both rivers, and we'll dive into more detail on some of them in just a bit. But what, I guess what I'm trying to convey here is that we're not waiting. We're trying to build parks now, yesterday, okay? This is a prime example. Okay, this is the San Gabriel River, and that roadway that's uh, the bridge that you see up and over the uh, San Gabriel, that's Beverly Boulevard. Okay, anyone know what this is here? What that parcel of land is? Has anyone ever seen that? Uh, nope. The, the, one, the parcel of land that's uh, highlighted in yellow right there. Anybody know what that is? That's the one that's between Beverly Road on the south and Beverly Boulevard to the north. I see you guys thinking pretty hard. Okay, I'll give you the answer. It's, it's not a quiz. <laughs> it's, it's our public works yard. This is where our public works crews uh, work from, right? This is where they uh, hold all of our equipment. This is where we have all of our material. This is where we have some office space for the supervisors and things like that, where we dispatch work and things like that. Now, if you've ever been there, you've ever seen it, you know that it's falling apart, okay? So one of the things that we are looking at is, you know, and the other thing too, you've probably seen it, our guys work really hard out there. And they deserve a state-of-the-art working environment, right? A state-of-the-art public works yard. Um, considering the fact that we haven't made investments into this facility in a really long time, they deserve it. But see, here's the thing. When we talk about being strategic, start talk about being smart about our investments. One thing we want to do is if we're going to build a new public works yard, we also want to ensure that it stimulates development in and around that exact same area. Basically to say, hey, if I'm gonna fix my fence, hey neighbor, wanna go in halves on it and maybe we can do it a little bit nicer, right? That's basically what we're doing. So. And I'm just going to show you just a, an image to excite the imagination. This is not what we're actually going to build, subject to a lot more input and, and comments and feedback. But I want to just give you an idea of like the direction that we're going in. When I talk about stimulating development along the riverfront, this is what I mean. If we make an investment into our very own property to ensure our guys have a state-of-the-art facility, what if we coordinated those investments with all of our neighbors? and we have new riverfront, vibrant um, space. For the same yeah, we don't anticipate moving it. Land is just way too expensive. And truthfully, it's an opportunity for us to stimulate the development and catalyze new development along the riverfront. Oh yeah, no question about that. Oh yeah, Absol absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question. I mean, we do that in phases. We would do that, obviously, being mindful of the neighbors and being, you know, we'd, we'd be careful about it. There's no question about it. But yes, you're absolutely right. We would have to move things to get things in, right? But again, what we're trying to say here is that we want to really stimulate new development along the riverfronts with the goal of increasing parks, open recreation space along the rivers, okay? This is a prime example, something that I had the good fortune of working on for almost 10 years. This is in the city of El Monte. So when people say, no, you can't do it, oh, no, actually, you can. A lot of cities are actually doing exactly that. Um, and so this is in the city of El Monte, where we worked with Metro, which is the property in the yellow. Uh, that's Metro property is also public property. They have their own governing board and their own process and all that. But this is the largest bus station west of the Mississippi. Anyone know where that is? Close. Close. It's in the city of El Monte. 
Yep, it's in the city of El Monte right off of Santa Anita Avenue, right? And what you see on the right-hand side, that's the Rio Hondo. We also have the Rio Hondo that flanks our city, right? So what we did here is we used the public land, and then we went to the neighbors and said, hey, we're going to make a sizable investment. Would you like to work with us on it so we can do a more comprehensive, holistic development in the area? And this is what's actually being built today. If you go, you'll see that some of these buildings are already completed. People already live there. Um, the bottom half, which is um, the one closer to the bottom of the screen, all of that are uh, rental units, for sale units, a combination of mixed incomes and some affordable, some median, some you know um, uh, at market rate, uh, a good mix. In the middle, on the metro land, they built office space for metro operational expansion, right? Because again, that's the largest bus station west of the Mississippi. So the people that work at metro need places to work. And then the white uh, part of the, the, the top left-hand corner, that's where you have a couple of hotels. And in the middle, you have more of an entertainment district. So they have you know, theaters, shops, restaurants, you know, things like that. So basically, what the way they designed it is live, work, play along the river, OK? And it's uh, you, it, actually, I need to in update this slide because you see that little triangle in the top right-hand corner right by the yellow line? That's an, uh, a fully restored park, uh, what they call, um, used to be called Fletcher Park. Now they call it Fetch Park. They turned it into a dog park, <laughs> something they didn't have before. Yeah, question. Yeah, no, 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 that's, and that's by design. That's by design. Um, it's dry, uh, one, because that particular river, the Rio Hondo, is designed to get water out of Dodge, right? And that's why you don't see that it's naturalized like the San Gabriel River. The San Gabriel River is designed to hold water and let that water percolate into the aquifer because then they pump the water and then we all drink the water once we treat it, of course. Yep, yep, because that, from that point south, again, it's designed to get water out of Dodge and get it straight out into the ocean from there. We have a question in the chat. Yes. Do you know when this El Monte concept will be complete? Good question. Um, so that that development started, I want to say, about eight, seven to eight years ago. Um, some of those buildings have already been completed. Um, I talked a little bit about the major unprecedented challenges that we faced, which is, of course, COVID-19, the economic downturn, and the unfunded mandates that put a major hamper on advancing that project uh, several years ago. Otherwise, they'd be a lot more advanced, and it just kind of threw a wrench into all the financing associated with that development. So hopefully that answers the question. But they are moving on it, uh, just a lot more slower, a lot slower than they originally anticipated. The yeah, the bus terminal is done. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the buildings uh, that surround it. So this is, again, when we talk about opportunities and we talk about you know, the, the corridors that we're evaluating, right? the first one we've been talking about is the river revitalization. right? So this here is the Rio Hondo. Um, on the top, the road that kind of cuts across, that's Washington Boulevard. right? That's where you have the Walmart, the Lowe's, and you know, the big shopping plaza on the northern side. But that in green, that is 544 acres of spreading grounds. I'll say, you can drive out there today, and you can see for yourself, it is filled to the brim with water. It is designed to be filled with water. Now, of course, we are currently facing historic weather. We've never seen weather like this in California. Well, maybe, but it's not in year, decades. Uh, I don't think anyone has seen the, this much snow on these mountains. 
right? So they're designed to fill up with water. But the truth is, in a normal year, when we don't, we're not facing historic weather, those spreading grounds are dry, bone dry, dust whirls, right? So here's the question. If it's dry 97% of the year, why can't we just go out and fly a kite? Lay a picnic blanket and play with the kids. You know, maybe kick a soccer ball, throw a football. Why can't the community just utilize it for passive recreational opportunities? Well, that's the question that we're working on with our county supervisor. Question. It could very likely have similar limitations. We cannot build any type of permanent infrastructure anywhere in any of that green zone. So you can't build a parking lot. Yeah. But that's where, that's where we talk about, again, the holistic planning, which we're talking about here. Okay. So let me get into that. Because if getting there with a car is a challenge because you can't park there, this is where the long-term planning comes in. Okay, thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. Because comment from the group chat? I mean, from yes. the Yes. Not a question, a comment? Concern about using the spreading grounds being open like that because it seems like a major aviary corridor. Yeah, like a big what? They said aviary corridor. Oh, uh, yeah, for birds. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are ways to design uh, open space uh, to accommodate for both passive recreation and for uh, natural ecosystem restoration, including uh, the floral, the fauna, uh, animal, wildlife, things like that. Uh, so those are all things that are definitely being taken into consideration and will be planned for accordingly, for sure. Thank you for that comment. And it will, go and under, uh, it will undergo a pretty comprehensive environmental review and study associated with that, and of course, all subject to environmental clearance by CEQA and NEPA. Okay, so Washington Boulevard, I want to emphasize, we have a light rail coming into Pico Rivera. It is not, I'll repeat, it is not a Pico Rivera project. We are not the sponsors. It is a metro project. That project was funded by Measure M. Right? It's a massive transportation measure that was introduced in 2016. That measure was approved by county voters by 73% of the vote. I say that because it's very difficult to turn that around. It can happen. It has happened. But it is incredibly difficult to change a vote or to change a measure that has been voted on by that amount of people. 73% of the LA County vote, mind you, it was in 2016 during a presidential election, so we had a larger voter turnout during that time, and it was practically a public mandate. 73% of the vote voted for, this, for these projects, these highway, I mean, sorry, these uh, transit expansion program at Metro. This is one of those projects. So the light rail is coming. It's a matter of when, OK? Now, because it's coming, we have to be very mindful and plan accordingly, right? Again, some people don't like these plans. I get it, 100% understand. But it's better to plan and be prepared than not, be planned, not plan and not be prepared at all which is exactly what happened in some other communities. East LA is a prime example. They knew the light rail was coming, and the county regional planning department did not plan accordingly. And as a result, they're still facing economic downturn associated with that light rail. They're still facing traffic jams, um, incidences that result in fatalities are serious because they didn't plan the roadways accordingly. They're now doing it in retrospect. We are trying to get ahead of the game, right? It's coming. 
We want to be prepared for that. So the blue zone is what we call the downtown transit-oriented environment. One of, remember we talked a little bit about state and federal mandates? Well, the state is requiring us to plan and build more affordable housing. Interestingly, they're also limiting our ability to provide parking. That's what's interesting about it. You want us to build more housing, but you don't want us to build parking associated with that housing. I get it. It's well-intentioned. Right? They don't want it to increase traffic. They don't want it to increase vehicle miles traveled. They don't want it to increase greenhouse gas emissions, which has led to you know, climate impacts, right? environmental impacts, more fatalities on the roadways, things like that. So they're limiting the amount of parking that we can provide at these housing developments. Okay, So that means, I'll get to your question in just a bit, that means we have to build housing around transit. That means the people who live in that housing have to adjust their lifestyles to get around on transit. Very interesting dynamic. Very hard to plan for. Okay, that's why they call it transit-oriented development. Yes. They're actually limiting, not, and the measurement tool isn't half a parking space for every residential unit. It's not like that. It's associated with greenhouse gas emissions. That's the limiting factor, right? So you cannot pass a certain greenhouse gas hold threshold. And if you invite, you know, 700 more cars into your community by doing a unit or a new, a new development, with 700 parking spaces, that's going to increase greenhouse gas emissions. That's the limiting factor. That's correct. We still have gas vehicles on the road. So, so let's just say you do this, right? You have 10 gas powered vehicles on the street, but you add 10 electric vehicles to the street, you still have 10 cars polluting. And, and here's the interesting thing, they're now backed up in that much more traffic. They're idling longer, they're impacting the streets longer, and therefore emitting more greenhouse gas emissions. No, no, don't get me wrong. It's way more complicated than my simple explanation for tonight's presentation. I can attempt to answer really, really quickly. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Mr. Sanchez. So at the legislative level, as you can see, we have the gold line coming in. That's considered trans rich transit, right? High quality transit. So at the state now is essentially prohibiting local cities from enacting what's called a parking minimum. So what that means is, for example, one spot per residential house, right, or room or whatever in a, in a dense area. So once that's gone, uh, you're essentially restricting the amount of parking that way. So that's the and easy, short and simple way. There, actually, there is no short and easy, simple way to really describe it because it's even more complicated than that, right? Because it ties into the freeway system, it ties into the arterial system, and it ties into the collector road system, and of course the environmental impacts associated with not just 10 cars on this road, it's 10 cars more in the region. And that's, and that's where it gets a lot more complicated too. Yeah, we could do a presentation on that gladly. Uh, we'd have to do that one another day though. Yep. Oh, it will, it has, it most certainly has. And the truth of the matter is into the future, I don't think that we would be able to approve a project of that scale with that much parking in the future. Yes, question. Um, so with the 
the the rail line itself it's a, a the rail line itself is electric it runs on what they call an electric catenary system so basically wires above head and then they have little wires that connect to it I mean, I don't want to say that there isn't any pollution associated with it. Um, there certainly is. Um, it's just far less than vehicular pollution, correct? Far less. And also with the metro, um, I remember they had, metro had a commission to look at the metro system. Yeah. We had a meeting here, too. Okay, but I went to that one, um, and Whittier was invited. Now, as far as that meeting goes, there were more people that were there against that line coming through uh, through here, Florida. So and people from Monticello, from East LA, they came down, also made spoke that um, they regret having that also in their city. Mm. Yeah. No, I understand. There, there's always. Oh no, no, no. So uh, let me back up a little bit. This, this was approved. This measure to fund these projects in 2016. Because they're getting deeper into the detail on all, on all of these projects, they're starting to get into more advanced design, which is where you start to learn about okay, there might we might generally say there's going to be impacts, versus this particular parcel of land is going to be impacted in this very specific way, and then we need you to comment on that. So they're at that point where they're starting to get into advanced design now, and they're now advancing also. Uh, through environmental clearance at both the state and at the federal level. So it's not that the council didn't listen to you. We've all, I mean, even us as staff, we all listen to the concerns. Well, Metro really didn't listen to the community. They just said, let me have a meeting so we could say and they're not get in trouble. They just let people speak their mind. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, you know, I also have to I also have to caution with that narrative as well because 15 20 people does not represent the population. You're right. 10 15 people might not want it. You're absolutely right. Maybe 1000 people might not want it. You're absolutely right. And it is their absolute right to voice those concerns. I guess what I'm trying to convey here is that if you really want that train not to come into Pico Rivera, you'd have to raise and mobilize a lot more people than that. Yeah. And you'd have to take those concerns to Metro. Well, it's kind of like, yeah. I mean, it, it can. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is it can. I don't want to discourage you from continuing to voice your concerns. Oh, no, but, but, but the thing is, is it, it, it's not a question of stopping the train unless you can mobilize thousands and thousands and thousands of people to change what has been approved by voters in 2016, it's very difficult to do that. I'm not saying that you can't. I'm just saying it's difficult. And I encourage you, if you feel that strongly about it, I encourage you to do it. But it is a decision that's made at Metro not not your local elected officials again and i'm not i know it's it's a tough it's a tough situation and that you know again us as staff we can't advocate one way or the other we have to work under the assumption that it's coming and how can we make the best omelet possible with the broken egg we got right so and part of me i just want to make sure that i acknowledge that our our mayor is officially in the house mayor if you'd like to maybe step to the mic say a couple things Let me get this. It doesn't go any taller than this. There you go. <laughs> well, I wanted to say good evening to everybody here. I appreciate you coming out to get a, more information on the projects that the city is uh, anticipating on doing over the next 
honestly, not just 13 years, 2035, but actually 40, 50 years from now. And one key point that Javier brought back, and I was listening on while I was on the freeway from work, Javier mentioned we want to bring back those riverfront areas, bring back the Riviera to Pico Rivera. And I thought, wouldn't that be nice in a couple years or decades we change the name to Pico Riviera because we have those riverfront places. Right? Riviera. All kidding aside, all these projects are positive for the community. We're really giving the city a facelift, a well-deserved facelift. And these type of uh, community forums, we've done three. This is a third one. We're going to be doing many more over the years. We anticipate doing uh, over the next several years. So um, please bring uh, all your friends and relatives that live in the community. Tell them to come out and participate because we want your input. We want to know how you feel about these projects because, after all, we're going to have your family, generation after generation, we hope, to stay in our community. And so with that, I'll give it back to Javier to continue with the presentation. And again, thank you for coming out and stay close. Pay attention to what we have uh, coming. And we have those uh, communication methods through Instagram and Facebook, and we have that virtual city hall. And please, by all means, download that uh, uh, Pico Rivera app, which allows you to do a lot of great things uh, uh, to, to execute pain bills and actually uh, reporting any type of fallen trees or potholes, etc. Okay, have yourself a good evening. Take care. All right, I'm going to move through this a little quicker because I still have one more presentation that's focusing on uh, uh, Whittier Boulevard. Uh, but we'll get that to that in just a little bit. But I do want to touch on this. So the blue zone, again, we're really looking to uh, look at this area for future growth in the community. We know we have to build housing. We don't have enough land. We've already built out, so there's no other way to go. you got to build up. We want to be smart. We want to be strategic about how we do that. We don't want to just start piling things on top of each other, right? So we have, again matter of being methodical here. So another thing that the region is uh, currently working on right now uh, is a bus rapid transit corridor, right? Now, it could look a lot different than that to be determined. I'll, I'll show a couple more slides to give you an idea of what it could or couldn't look like. But the idea here is that we have a bus rapid transit corridor that goes from the mountains, the San Gabriel Mountains, all the way to the Pacific Ocean along Rosemead Lakewood Boulevard. Now, Early projections, early um, analysis shows that if you were to hop on that bus and it gets every green light going south to Long Beach, you can be at the airport in 25 minutes from Pico Rivera, right? At the same, well, actually, I'll get into that one in a little bit. So now we're starting to build out what you would call, again, a transit-oriented community, which is what this... Um, the kind of the state is encouraging all cities to kind of the direction to move in. Now, here's another very fascinating thing that is already in our city. We have a commuter railroad that goes right through Pico Rivera, and we don't even benefit from it at all. Everyone, anyone ever been on the Pacific Surfliner Amtrak? Yeah, it takes you right to San Diego. If you want to go north, all the way to, yeah, San Clemente takes you all the way to San Luis Obispo, um, you know, downtown LA. Uh, there's also the Metrolink Orange County line that takes you all the way to Oceanside. Um, the 91 Paris Valley line that takes you, all, obviously, to Paris Valley. Um, the Southwest Chief Amtrak runs on these tracks also. That's the one that goes from LA to Chicago. Well, two weeks ago, Metro... We introduced, the city of Pico Rivera introduced a motion at Metro to build a new station here in Pico Rivera. So imagine hopping on a train and going all the way to San Luis Obispo from Pico Rivera. And mind you, per state law, these are the same tracks or the same right-of-way that high-speed rail will eventually come through. Now, it's not going to travel 200 miles an hour, obviously, in this area. It's too congested for that. But high-speed rail is supposed to come through here as well, if it ever does. We'll see if they ever get the money for it, right? But the idea is if it did come, 
and you can hop on a train in Pico Rivera and head all the way to San Francisco, wow, that'd be pretty fascinating. You know, again, just another option to add to this transit rich environment. Yes, question. I'm sorry, uh, my backside. Can it stop in Mount Bell and pick up our customers? It can. And then the next city, the next. The one in Montebello? The one in Montebello is actually on a whole different set of tracks. That's what they call the Riverside Line. That's the one that goes all the way to Cal, near Cal Poly Pomona, kind of runs kind of like east-west. This one runs more kind of north-southeast. Well, my point is, we're not going to be the only city adding capacity to that. Oh, so that's, okay, I'm glad you, okay, I, I see what you're saying. So good good question because um, you're, the question is, is that you're going to have a lot more stops along the way, right, in every city. So the thing about commuter railroad is that it's a big train, you know, the size of a regular freight train, huge. Those are regulated by the federal government, so you can't have a stop that often on these tracks. They have to travel a certain distance before they stop. That's why they call it commuter railroad. The, on the other hand, that's where you get light rail, what's going on Washington Boulevard. That can stop every two blocks, every four blocks, right? It's designed to be more of a localized mobility uh, transit line. Question? Yeah, along the same lines, I mean, and I, I brought this up before, you know, and I feel like since I think this is my talk, but we have this kind of train station in Kansas that's all stuff that we talked to us in the back for this to be for here in Miami. And we used to have a parking board problem. Like, yeah. I think I mentioned this to you last time. Happy to mention it again. I have to remind you, we're being limited and restricted by the amount of parking we can build. So, not to say, not to say that we're not, and I, again, I mentioned this last time, we are definitely thinking about incorporating parking, but it has to be very strategically located in the area right, so that it doesn't back up traffic to all these other cities or the, to the freeway and so on. It's not that we're not incorporating it. It's not the priority because we're also being restricted to it. Going back to the train station, would that have its own parking? To be determined. To be determined. We don't know yet. We haven't gotten that far down. We barely just introduced the motion to ex finally explore it. Comment in the Zoom chat. So it is possible for someone to live without a, without a car in that area since there's so much within walking distance. So I believe that's uh, to what. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to touch on another little kind of the missing link. I'll get to you in a bit. I'm going to touch on the missing link between all of these major transit lines, but I'll touch on that in just a little bit. Yeah, question. Yes, correct. That's uh, it, right where the number six is. So that road that runs kind of like right to the right-hand side of it, north-south, that's Paramount. Mm -hmm. That's where the old swap meet used to be, the indoor-outdoor swap meet, right? That's where it's at. Yeah. So uh, there are no residential. Well, I guess there is like on the other side, but yeah, question. So yes, we have. We have looked at that. Um, there's a very significant challenge in this particular area uh, that's going to, um, uh, essentially, it's a constraint that restricts us from going down. So, so the, we have the water table. So you see all these spreading grounds. So the water table is very high in this particular area. So I think the lowest, well, I, it, I don't want to say exactly how low because I really don't know, but you can't go too deep in this area. Now, the other thing about building up, it's hard to do that unless you have sufficient foundational structures. So you can't build very high unless you build very low, right? So that those are all going to be limiting constraints. All of those things we're going to evaluate to determine what is the right mix of height, density, uh, and all that. But we have looked at that, and it, that presents a very significant challenge. All right. So a couple things. Um, 
I mean, I keep saying I'm going to move on, but look, really fast. So this opens up an opportunity. Now that we've kind of uh, are introducing what I'm calling the trifecta of high-quality transit, light rail, bus rapid transit, commuter rail, and then you have the Rio Hondo, which has a bike path. The other thing that we are going to be looking at, remember the impacts to the sports arena? We talked about that at the beginning. So we want to see whether or not there's an opportunity to introduce a sports and entertainment complex in this transit-oriented downtown environment. We don't know if it's possible. We're going to explore it. Um, it might be possible. And if it is, the question is, what would you like to see there, right? So the other thing we're going to look at is this yellow zone, what we are calling the microelectric vehicle Silicon River District. That's a fancy name. We're just kind of using it for marketing purposes. But uh, the idea here is that we're establishing what they call an agglomeration economy, right? Uh, when you think about Hollywood, you think about movies, Burbank, the movie studios. Those are clusters of businesses that all kind of in the same industry, right? Detroit is where you build cars. Uh, Manhattan, New York, that's the finance district for the entire world, practically. Uh, Silicon Beach and Silicon Valley, big tech. So those are all what you call agglomeration economies where you get a bunch of businesses that all within the same sector of the industry. We want to focus on becoming the Detroit of personal electric mobility devices. Fancy term also for just saying electric bikes, electric scooters, electric wheelchairs, electric golf carts, electric whatever, small devices, right? Fill in the blank. So the idea is we don't have an agglomeration economy for that subsector of the, of the transportation industry. So we want to create that here in Pico Rivera. Why? Because we want to train our youth to work on the electric vehicles that are coming and provide high quality, good paying, career-based jobs focused on designing, conceptualizing, designing, um, engineering, manufacturing, assembling, servicing, and then eventually recycling the full product life cycle for these types of products. Stamped, hecho en Pico Rivera, right? That's what we're establishing here in this area. All right, so all together, we are trying to repurpose 888 acres of land in Pico Rivera to establish a formal downtown Pico Rivera. Okay? All right. I'm going to skip that one because that's the gold line. We already talked about it a little bit. I'm going to get through that one. Again, not necessarily what we're proposing, but just to inspire the imagination a little bit, right? If this is what it looks like today, what could it look like 20 years from now? Maybe like this? Right? We have a light rail. That's Washington Boulevard, obviously. Uh, it could look like that to be determined. Right? doesn't necessarily have to be right here. Again, um, we'll get into finer detail as we kind of go along this planning effort. Um, this is the old Rodeo site. Probably know about this one. Again, someone mentioned it a little bit earlier, the Mercury Project. This is the downtown area. Uh, Washington Boulevard on the bottom, Rosemead on the left, looking south towards the beach. What if it looks more like this, right? Where, again, we emphasize the need for parks, open space in the urban fabric, but in the form of a plaza, a paseo, a walking promenade lined with outdoor dining, with, you know, uh, features, amenities, things like that all well connected. This is that Rosemead Lakewood Boulevard, what we are calling the Complete Corridor Project. Uh, we're working closely with the region on this one. So we already, the COG, the Council of Governments, which represents 33 cities, I think it is, in or 27 cities in the Gateway subregion, basically from Pico Rivera all the way down to the beach. Uh, they are working, they developed a Complete Streets Master Plan, which is basically all the active transportation stuff. But then the idea is that we want to see if there is an opportunity to incorporate a bus rapid transit corridor because um, now, again, because we're forced to reduce vehicle miles traveled, 
Uh, that means we the, the target is looking at single occupant vehicles, right? One bus moves 60 to 65 people, whereas one car can only move about maybe five people, right? So the idea is how do we get more people through the corridor versus more cars, right? Yes? They do. They do. They do. Foothill Transit to our north are the first ever in LA County to unveil those. And they unveiled those about a year and a half ago. Um, and they use them on, on the Silver Line. And that is another bus rapid transit corridor. And they are double deckers. And I think the maximum uh, capacity for those, if I'm not mistaken, are about 85 people. I could be a little bit off on that. Yeah. Yeah, some cities do double deckers or some regions do double deckers. Uh some uh regions do articulated buses, you know the ones that look like accordions in the middle. Some do that. Um but I think the overall idea here is that we can start small and if the corridor starts to grow with more housing, more dense development, more downtown picos if you will, and we see more people again, we still can't provide parking, but we can grow the bus. And we can add, add capacity. Right. So that's the idea is to increase capacity along this and then incrementally grow the service based on demand in the corridor. All right. So that's kind of what it looks like. The cool thing is if you look on the map on the left-hand side, that bus line will also connect you to the Foothill Gold Line in Pasadena. It'll connect you to the Silver Line, basically the, the uh, double-decker bus that we talked about. It'll connect you to the San Bernardino Line, It'll connect you to the West Santa Ana branch, the East Side Gold Line that's coming here in Pico Rivera. And again, it also connects you to the airport, the Long Beach VA, Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach for all the students in the area who maybe can't afford a car, don't want to buy a car. Um, anyway, it provides you access to a lot of um, major destinations and uh, points of interest in our region. Okay? Again, not necessarily recommending or suggesting that it does look like this. Again, it's just to give you an idea of what a station could look like, right? Something like this. Maybe more like this. Again, it just, it's just a matter of uh, getting down to the details um, when we eventually get to that point. We're at the very early, 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 early stages in this entire project. This is that railroad I was telling you about. We've already talked about it quite a bit. But let me just uh, fill in a couple details. So the overall idea here is that, see this station right there? That's the downtown area. That's an existing station, this one here. It represents a major bottleneck in the railroad um, for both BNSF, the freight railroads, for the commuter railroads. It has to go anyway. It's just in a bad location. So that's why... It, present, it, it presented an opportunity for the city of Pico Rivera to just simply say, hey, if you're going to get rid of it anyway, why don't you just move it over here where we're going to have connections to the light rail, to the bus rapid transit, to the river, to the downtown, all that stuff. And it worked out kind of nicely. Um, so that's kind of like what we're doing. So we're essentially introducing a new station in that particular area. This is that area, right? The, you got the river on the left -hand, bottom left-hand corner. You can barely see it, but in the top right-hand corner, that's Paramount going under the railroad, okay? North, that way. So this is where the station platform could be, right? A lot more design and engineering. This is obviously very high level. But what if it looks more like this, right? Where you can get show up and then... The idea within this corridor is they want to increase the service to about 15 minutes frequencies, which means every 15 minutes you show up, you got a train going to San Luis Obispo, or you got a train going to San Diego, or you got a train going to Anaheim, or a train going to Fullerton, or to Oceanside, or to San Clemente, or San Juan Capistrano, whatever. But every 15 minutes you've got a train coming by to pick you up. Okay. So again, modern... Uh, what we call a modern day renaissance kind of in the making again these are all some of, a lot of these things are already happening the light rail is already happening the railroad is already there the bus rapid transit already happening 
So again, we're just trying to make the best omelet we can with what we've got, considering the impacts also from the Whittier Narrows Dam that we talked about at the very beginning. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. If not, we're going to jump right in. And uh, the next presentation, I'm going to go kind of quickly. Hmm? You want to give your, give a quick update, or you want to wait till? Because I can go through. Would, um, I can get through Whittier Boulevard a little quicker. That's where you got to go. All right, for those on the Zoom call, we have Captain Jody Hutag of our Pico Rivera Sheriff's Department providing a public safety update. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm Jody Hutag. I'm the captain at Pico Rivera Station. And I, they invited me to come and, you know, be a part of the town halls because, you know, one of the things that was important to me when I, you know, took over the command at Pico Rivera Station is I wanted to make sure that the community felt and knew that they had access to me, to my staff, to our station. And, you know, one of the, you know, big concerns if you live in a community is the safety of your community, right? Because, you know, outside of uniform, like, I'm the community too. And so, you know, I understand what your concerns are and some things, you know, we, we can fix quickly and some things we can fix slowly and some things very, very slowly. And so, you know, but we target our efforts according to where the problems are. And so we track portions of where the problems are according to what our crime stats are. And the crime stats are generated by reports that are made by people in the community. And uh, the other way that we can track where the problems are is when you bring them to our attention. So there may be things that are going on that we don't know about. And so, you know, by, you know, being taking the time to, you know, come in front of you and, and whether you want to tell me tonight or whether you want to, you know, tell me later or or call the station or email, the, the point is that we're, we're here to hear you. It's not like, well, we know we have sheriffs, but who are they? And that's not what we want. And so, you know, that, that community relationship is, is important to us. So uh, really, I wanted to hear from uh, you guys. I spoke at one of the uh, more recent ones that we had, and I went into, you know, a little more details on some of the issues that we're having up in the in the north north end of the city, but I wanted to kind of get an idea, first of all, where you live, where your concerns are, and that way maybe I can direct more of my information to you based on, you know, where you live and what your concerns are. So with that, does anyone want to start with um, any questions you have? Of course. Rosemead and Beverly on the west side, are you talking about where the motel is? Like almost towards Gallatin? Okay. I can picture what you're talking about. Okay. What? Okay. So, so the question is, what is going? What happened there? What are they going to build there? Or the problems that are going on there now? No, I mean, what happened there? Because there seems to be a gathering place. Right? So, I mean, something that happened during the summer is not going to be happening. Okay, I would have to look into that. I don't know what that is.
Yeah, in the uh, the profile. Yeah, actually, that's a that's a good idea. It's funny that you said that right now because I opened up in the city that I live in. They have, I mean, it's a little section that's about that big, but it says these are the number of reports that you know this number. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great idea. Darn it! Okay. <laughs> Extension for me, no. Um, so we, we do have a crime analyst, and so she works specifically with our crime stats, and so whenever I'm asked for anything, I go to her and she crunches the numbers, and so that's definitely something we can do. One of the things that, you know, and we do provide information as we're asked for it. One of the things that was recently requested was our response times. And, you know, and that's something that, you know, giving a little bit of uh, background and information and explaining how that works, uh, you know, our response times gives uh, in perspective that our overall that our station does very well. We're well with under we're well under the, the department thresholds. So although there are certain circumstances where we may not get there as quick as, you know, you would like or as quick as we should. But on the whole, when they average out all of our response times, we're well under the threshold. So that's one of the things that I provide them. But uh, I like that idea. And so that'll be part of our uh, monthly, and that's easy to do. If you scroll down a little bit, and you can also, when you download the app, it's also on the app, pretty simple to find. Uh, you scroll down, 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 little mark to the tile, right there. And then if you look at the bottom row, second from the left, crime and safety, uh, bottom row, right there where it says crime and safety gauge, right there. If you click on that, it'll open up the crime and safety update page. And this, don't scroll down a little bit more, has a very neat and interactive map that provides you with relatively up-to-date statistics on crime and safety in the community. You can narrow it down. Like if you wanted to know, oh, you know, where's the most amount of car thefts happening over the last 10 days? and it'll give you that information. Uh, you can put in you know, whatever it is that you're interested in looking up, but I just recommend when you get home maybe spending a little bit of time to better learn how to use this because it's a really neat tool and it can help you, you know. A lot of the, what, what, what brought this to, um, to the attention was uh, the retirees that are not computer savvy or what they do depend on. Absolutely right. And I'm, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make it sound as if we were replacing one with the other. This is just to add on oh, to the option. resource, of yeah. To, absolutely. Right. Well, Which I did not know was there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, 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 it's okay. So there's a, a website called Crime Mapping, and it's it's essentially what this is based off of, and it's public access. You can type in your zip code, and it will, you know, again, it's, it's basically it's that. You know, you can, you can click on, you know, the type of crime or your specific area, the intersection, and the way that those numbers are calculated is every time you're given a report number or every time there is a report taken, 
uh, there is what's called a stat code, which is the very end three numbers. And those go into a large database, and that's how they're all collected based on those stat numbers. Those, those three digits at the end tells you what kind of crime it is. And so that's how, they're, that's how, they're, that's how that data is collected, is based on that three little digits at the end of your, your report number. Yes? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I found out that he had taped the mic to the floor and something in the, like midnight or something like that from other people that already knew about it. So how was the public or the residents supposed to know of this? Are they supposed to know of this right away? How does that info get to the... Is it something we shouldn't even care or know about? Well, every situation is different, but this situation in particular, I can talk about it because it did happen here. And so when it happened early in the morning, it was about you know, five in the morning or so. And when something like that happens, we call our major crimes bureau, which is like a larger detective entity that's essentially, they're detectives, but they work on a larger scale, which is countywide and in, in, you know, multiple counties. So they're, they're bigger than our detective bureau here at the station. So... We had, immediately we get on that and they start doing their, you know, they start looking for their leads. And the information that we had on this person to put it out, in any situation, we balance the information that we give to the public to make sure that it isn't going to compromise the investigation. Because what happens is when information gets put out, it's like an uh, operator. You know, I tell him one thing and by the time it gets to you, it's totally not what I said. <laughs> so we have to be careful and balance the the need to keep the investigation intact and balance that against the need for the public to know. Well, because he wasn't a, a threat to us in the community or was that basically? That was part of it. He wasn't an immediate threat to the community and we the information that we had when we were tracking him is he left the area quickly. So he was only in our area from the time that he got to the station until the time that he got outside of the bounds of Pico Rivera. What's that? Uh, as of now, no. So the decision was made once the information that we had. So there was, we had dogs out that were tracking. We had uh, the helicopter that was up. 
we had multiple uh, other units from the other areas of our county coming in to track, you know, where he was. We had taps on the phone. Uh, we monitored the phone calls. We went to last known addresses. And so there was a lot of footwork that went on behind the scenes, and we were able to determine very quickly that he was no longer in the area and his ties are not actually in the area. And so we deemed that it wasn't a threat to the community. So at that point, we weighed, okay, so do we put out the information knowing that he's now in, you know, South Central L.A.? Uh, that was the last information that we had had. And so it was at this point, you know, do we put a follow-up out and say this is what happened, but he's gone, he's not in the area? So, you know, the the decision was made to uh, – essentially wait to see if anything materialized. And at that point, once nothing did, at this point we're now we're a couple days later, so, you know, do we go back and then alert everyone that didn't know in the first place? So that was, it was, that, it, in the, the notification was a discussion that came up, you know, because, hey, how come this didn't go out? And it was a decision that we made to, to let it pass because at that point he wasn't a threat, so we didn't want to create uh, – concern for the information that wasn't really out there. Even though the news put it out there, it was something that kind of came and went very quickly. So it was almost like, do we bring it to people's attention and then scare them when they didn't even know that it was happened in the first place? So, you know, it was it was kind of on the fence. And so that was the decision that we made. And so you're not the first person that has brought that to my attention. So that was the reason why. You know, whether it was the right thing or not, you know, I don't know, but clearly there are people who have, you know, expressed concerns with, well, we want to know anyways. Um, sure. Understood. If there was a concern for the kids in the school, then the notifications would have been made. At that point, you know, we gave it about 24 to 36 hours for the, our major crimes detectives to do their work. And once we were uh, satisfied that he was no longer in the area, there was no threat to the schools. So there was no reason for us to alarm the schools um, and advise them that this is what was going on. Sure, understood. And and with every situation, yes, and, and I'll, I'll get to you, with every situation, you know, decisions are made for certain reasons at the time, you know, kind of like parenting, right? And then you get later on down the road and they say, well, we didn't like the way that you did this and we didn't like the way you did that. And you may be right. And we take that in and we learn from it and we go, okay, should we do this different? You know, at the time, that was the decision we made and that was why. Was it right or not? I don't know, you know, and there are both sides. And that's in the handling of any situation that we do. This is what we did. You've got one side that says you should have done it this way and the other side that says, no, you did right. And so that's why I, I welcome the disagreements. That's totally okay. Um, but again, we still go back and go, hey, you know what? Maybe I could have done this different. I could have done that different. And it's always evaluated. It's always evaluated. But, you know, we make the decisions that we make at the time based on the information that we have and what we feel is the best thing for the whole. Um, and then, you know, we, we debrief later and see if, if we did do it right. So, of course. Yes, sir. Hey, yes. My name is Cesar Perez. I'm with Jerome Bingham Family Support. I met you a couple of weeks ago. I want to thank you and give you kudos for actually doing a great campaign. Thank you. There are many uh, districts and communities where I've seen you many times within the last couple of, of weeks. And I want to thank you for coming out to the same event. Yeah. Uh, for oh, yeah. Kids. kids love you guys there. And They're cute. I want to tell you that uh, Office of the Principal is actually really great. Uh, we think you can, all of your scholars should come and help us out. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for your social media. And we're here to help you guys out. Thank you very much. Captain Hutech, you have one question on the Zoom. Yes, please. They said they'd like to know if the license plate readers are making an impact in the community. 
Yes, they are actually. And some, so the license plate readers, the, what they do is they're, they're snapshots as cars go through intersections, their license plates that are, are picked up by the cameras and it's downloaded into these big databases. And so there's two ways that they can be used. They can be used in the immediate. So if a car goes through an intersection and that plate is picked up and it's determined to be a felony vehicle of whatever type, whether it's a stolen vehicle, vehicle used in a crime, uh, an alert will come up and give the deputies in the field the opportunity to go to the area where the car was last seen and conduct felony traffic stops and take the you know, people into custody and do their investigation. So that's one avenue to use them. The other avenue to use them is on the investigative side. So if you are the victim of a crime and you say it was a red car and it had a sticker in the back, I, the, I only got the license plate, it was a three, and that was all I saw. So we go back to the database and we plug in all the information that you get, and then we look at the intersection of where you reported the crime and see if there are if a, light, a car that matched that description uh, went through the intersection. And from there, you know, they can do some backward, you know, investigative stuff to try to identify the vehicles. And so we have been able to do that. Uh, there were two, there was one incident in particular, and, and, and this was, I actually believe I brought this up at city council. We had an individual who reported their family member who was, uh, elderly and had Alzheimer's and, uh, left, the house with just the vehicle and the keys and left all the, the phone ID and all the, you know, any identifying information at home. And they were like, we don't know what to do. And so we took the license plate and we plugged it into the, our, our Alper camera system. And it was last pegged in Pomona because a lot of neighboring cities are still are, are on this same system. And so we were able to notify Pomona PD and they checked the intersection where the vehicle was last seen. They found the vehicle, they found her. She had been involved in a traffic collision, but she was okay. It was a single vehicle traffic collision, but because of the cameras, they were able to find her and reunite her with her family. So, you know, that that is an advantage to that. So, yes, we have found some success. Yes. Yes, we utilize the flock system. They're now the Alper is automated license plate reader. And there are different types of cameras, but flock is the company that is used who has the cameras installed in their, their software that we use. Yes. The red light cameras. The red light camera systems, they, when they snap the picture of the plate, it does not pick it up on the reflections. This is a different system and that doesn't, that doesn't happen with this system. But with the red light cameras, you know, where they take a picture and then they, you get the ticket in the mail. That, yeah. So it, it, that is a crime, actually. It's, in, it's a, in the vehicle code that you cannot put reflective tape on license plates. And so that is a citable offense. They actually take the color, they scribble, like, the whole color of the plate So like an anti, an anti, like a, uh, an anti -reflective, yeah. like a reflective thing? So what that is, it's when you flash the license plate, what that paint does, it just makes it all bright. So you can't read the numbers. Yeah. Correct. Correct. That's also a, a violation of the vehicle code. Yes, your the the lights have to work on the. Yeah, actually, if you if you Google California vehicle code, it's got all the lists of all the infractions and you know everything that that your car is supposed to have. So yes, it has to have a a, a light you know shining on the license plate, and it can't have the cover, and it can't have the reflections, and it has to have the current tags and. <laughs> all righty yeah. thank you all for your questions we appreciate that any anything else to add captain hutek no no that's all i have but um i you know we are available to you like i said at the very beginning and you know we are pretty easy to access we've got you know our own 
station, uh, social media. I actually have my own for people that reach out to me. And I actually look at the social media, the stuff that people put on there. And even when people make complaints on there, when it's not directly to me, I will still reach out to them uh, because it's something that I saw. Because anytime I have a chance to evaluate something that we did, and, you know, sometimes we don't do things right, but sometimes we do. And for the times we don't, I still want to make contact with that person and let them know where we can do better. And the times that we do, like the most recent time, we actually did do everything right. She just didn't understand. And so I provided her an explanation of why we did what we did. And, and so she was appreciative of that time. But, you know, the, the point is that, you know, having that connection, then there's so many avenues to, to do it. You know, people that are social media savvy and have all the websites. I mean, I have to ask my 15-year-old how to do some of the social media stuff. Uh, but we come to these things in person. We go to the city events. Even if it's just like, hey, we're here to, to party, like at the senior center, you know. I'm there, you know, and you can you still flag me down, huh? Pizza with a cop. Pizza with a cop, yes. Um, but, you know, even the, the city. People get a hold of the city. You know, I get messages from our, our council members and say, hey, can you reach out to this person? So, like... I, I am I am able to be gotten a hold of. Yes. Oh no no we do them frequently. I mean every I, I think we like every other month or so. Yeah, we ended up with the pizza with the cop because we did a walk to school with the kids day and a kindergartner said, you should do it at Chuck E. Cheese so I can come. And I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. So we did it at Chuck E. Cheese because of the kindergartner. <laughs> hey, not all cops drink beer. Some cops don't drink at all. So anyway, if you have any questions. Uh, all right, guys, let's jump into the last presentation. We only have a little bit of time left, about 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll get through it a little bit quickly. Hopefully we can leave questions to the end. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about the uh, corridors and the, you know, the strategic approach that we're taking to improve the community throughout the city. This particular project is dedicated just to Whittier Boulevard, right? You already saw that we're doing things all over the city. This one in particular is just a little bit more advanced because we've been very successful in securing resources, grants, uh, direct funding from the state legislature, et cetera. All right, anyhow, let me get through it really quick. Um, this is what our program management structure looks like, where, of course, we get guidance and direction from our city council, of course, executive management. Uh, but then we also have a project management and outreach and engagement team, right? And then for that, we also have a, a layer of stakeholder advisory groups. Uh, we also have a technical advisory committee, a blue ribbon committee, and we're also in the process of establishing a youth ambassador program with, uh, in partnership with the school district. And then the whole revitalization program on Whittier Boulevard consists of, as you can see, quite a few projects. I won't list them. We're going to go over them in just a little bit. All right. So this is the study area that we're looking at for Whittier Boulevard. It's really from the river, San Gabriel all the way to the other river, the Rio Hondo. But we also included Durfee Avenue because we felt that there's a need to revitalize that area and do it all kind of at the same exact time. So anyhow, um, th again, not necessarily what we're proposing, but maybe to give you some ideas, again, to inspire the imagination, give you a sense of the direction that we're moving in, right? So this is what the heart of Uptown Pico Rivera currently looks like. But what if it looked more like this in the future, right? We already know that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of sun in sunny California. So we want to take advantage of that. Is there an opportunity to incorporate more rooftop dining, balcony, lounges, uh, outdoor dining on the sidewalk, things like that, right? So we want to see if we can create more of a walkable, bikeable, kind of place-based uh, experience-oriented environment for the community here, okay? We also received a big grant from the state of California. Again, there's a huge emphasis to move from car-centric roadways to more multimodal roadways. And the reason for that, a couple reasons. One, of course, the um, state of California wants us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with cars, right? But at the same time, Durfee, Whittier Boulevard 
is part of a high injury network, which means there's a lot of accidents between cars and pedestrians or cars and bicyclists. The state of California also requires us to dedicate space for what they call vulnerable roadway users, youth, seniors, people with disabilities, um, um, bicyclists, et cetera. So the idea is that we dedicate safe accommodations for these individuals, right? Oop. Oops, okay, so we're also, uh, most of you are probably very familiar with this arcway in uh, East LA unincorporated community. It's iconic. Everybody knows about this thing. I mean, people, when they cruise Whittier Boulevard, they stop traffic to take a picture with this thing. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that we replicate this thing in Pico Rivera. No, no, no. But where is our Pico Rivera iconic feature on Whittier Boulevard? We don't have one. Why not? What's that? Oh, the, 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 yeah, the Camino Real, the bells, is not unique to Pico Rivera, though. It's actually the state of California. In Pico Rivera, there's still uh, quite a few. Oh, yeah. No, no, you're right. You're along the entire corridor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I didn't find out about the uh, Camino Real bells until this gentleman, Gabe, here told me about it. And I remember one time driving up the, the 101 to go camping, and I wasn't paying attention. I was just kind of like just in his own driving, and I'm like, what the heck? That bell? Oh, shit, that's the one that Gabe was telling me about. And, uh, anyway, but you're right. You, there was a long stretch where I didn't see the bell. Anyhow, again, the idea here, the takeaway is, can we create something that's just as iconic but unique to Pico Rivera, right? And we are going to be exploring that with the community. We're asking the community to participate in the process, join us on the journey, provide input, feedback, comments, suggestions, concerns. What is it that you want to see? What is it that you don't definitely want to see, right? So that's the idea. On top of that, you may have heard in the news that the city has been very strategic about identifying land to purchase or to convert into parks and open space, right? We heard about the Wader Narrows Dam and the loss of open space. So this is the old Montebello Bus Depot. We just got a million dollars to buy this property, and we bought it. We just sealed and had the contract delivered to us. It is ours. Okay. On top of that, we got another million dollar grant to actually turn it into a neighborhood park. So we're going to incorporate a whole bunch of different features into the park, right? A butterfly garden, some flexible community space, an amphitheater, a bike hub, a number of different things. But the cool thing is going to be more like a micro urban forest where you have a bunch of uh, trees and canopy and things like that. So really exciting opportunity for this part of town in the, again, the heart of the uptown area. On top of that, you may have heard about the Mines Avenue uh, bikeway project. That consists of two parts. One is Mines Avenue itself, right? The idea was to connect the river to the river on Mines Avenue because we have the library, the park, you know, all these different things, amenities for the community, the senior center, the women's club. So unfortunately, the second element to that project, which is the bridge, was denied by Southern California Edison. Understandably, there are some power lines that went above head. They're changing their policies. Long story short, they denied it. So we had to get very creative. We went after some more state money, and we got funding to explore a new location for that bridge. And now we're thinking about putting it closer to Whittier Boulevard. That's not the exact location where we're planning to put it. To be determined, we're at a lot of engineering work to be done there, a lot of analysis. But I'm sure you guys have seen the park right there, right? Not the place to go at night, right? So we want to clean that up. We want to work with the county. We want to help clean it up because we want to connect it, right? On top of that, on the other side of the bridge, you have another little trail that we're advancing that would connect the community to Pio Pico State Historic Park. Little fact, not sure if you knew this, but that is the only historic monument along the entire stretch of the San Gabriel River from the heart of the inside of the mountains all the way to the ocean. You obviously know the significance behind this whole thing. I don't have to get into it, right? That's what makes this place so historic, 
right? Hence, Historic Whittier Boulevard. We want to connect this place with a family-friendly, off-street community environment, right? So these are some of the ideas that we're looking at for the bridge. They do have to incorporate new kind of what they call green elements, uh, shrubbery, water capturing systems, things like that. Um, so we want to make sure that it kind of ties in with the surrounding community, with the revitalization of the corridor, and, you know, give it a new historic vibe, right? Then, uh, has anyone ever been to a Ciclovia open streets event, right? So you, if you've been, you know they attract anywhere from 60 to about 150,000 people. We're finally going to have one here in Pico Rivera. We are partnering with the surrounding communities, East LA, from the end of the Gold Line, down Atlantic, all the way down Whittier Boulevard till it connects with Greenleaf. All right? And then we're going to have a huge activity zone in Pico Rivera, where we're going to have a car show on Durfee Avenue. Right? Yeah, we're going to do a lot of really cool, fun, exciting things. We're going to engage the school district and the kids, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Right? It's a big festival, but the idea also is not just to get out and party on the street. Yeah, that could be one. It's going to be it's a festival, no question about that. But it's also an opportunity to engage the public on this really exciting program along Whittier Boulevard. So we're 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 going to do what we call demonstrations where you can interact with what the future of historic Whittier Boulevard could actually look like. Really exciting. I don't want to give away too much of what we're going to do, but uh, all of that's in development. Now, you know the dates and all that? Yeah, October 8th. Let me go right back there. Oh. Yep, Sunday, October 8th, 2023 is the date that's been selected. No, oh, don't say that. <laughs> question, question. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we want to we want to leverage the fact that we have that many people coming into the city. So we want to drive economic activity to our local businesses. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we 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 do have it on the website. The information that's on the website now is very limited, and that's largely because we just kicked off all the planning process or the the planning efforts. So, but more information to come for sure. Stay stay tuned. All right, and then. No, we're not waiting for 10 years to start breaking ground on things, right? I think I mentioned that at the very beginning of my presentation. We're doing things now. We're doing things tomorrow. And we're planning for things to do for the next 15, 20, 30, 50 years. This is one of the projects that's currently in development, being built today as we speak. This is the median revitalization or the median beautification of uh, all the medians along the major corridors, Whittier Boulevard being one of them. So we adopt... We adopted, I know, we adopted a, uh, um, a median landscape uh, master plan, 2019. And as a result, we have secured quite a significant amount of money from the state government to basically build it out now. So that's kind of what, it, that's what it's going to look like, or give you an idea of what it looks like. This one's really exciting for me. We're preparing a grant application now as we speak. This is a huge opportunity for us because that's what these alleys look like today. What if they look more like this? Right? Oh, keep waiting. <laughs> what if it looked more like that? Right? Where it's actually a place to hang out. Where you can do outdoor dining and you can, you know, we could capture water. We can have canopy trees, overhead lighting, safety lights, things like that. Yeah, question? But isn't that already uh, where people actually have in and out easily? Yeah, access. Yeah. And we're not, we're not restrict that access. No, 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 not while people are out there. I mean, we, there's going to have to be restrictions associated with all of that. Exactly, exactly. It's all going to be by design. It's all going to be by design. Or would you be happy that your alley is going to be beautiful? No, no, It's a great, con it's a, it is a very realistic concern. You're absolutely right. But again, the idea is not necessarily to come in and, I think, I think what we're trying to convey here is that we're not coming in to tell you what's happening. We're here to invite you to the process, right? And if you have a realistic concern, we want to hear about it because we want to plan around it. Because you know already right there is that uh, winery or that 
the brew, uh, brewery. Yeah. But as of right now, it's not regulated in any way, right? No. So that's the idea. So we want to introduce meaningful regulation that helps to address that. Now, again, is it perfect? Probably not, no, no. right? But would we prefer to? I mean, and again, this is all going to be a question we're going to pose to the que to the community. Would you yeah. prefer to have that or not have that? Or right. So then the question is. So then the real question is, where's the balance? Yeah. Yeah, no, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. But we again, we're going to engage all of those neighbors uh, and the grander community as well uh, as a part to as a part of the process. Um, here's another um, example of what it, uh, one of the existing alleys, right? That's Caramore. You have uh, Mario's Tacos on the right hand side, but the, this is a corner that can maybe look more like this, right? Again, it's just a just an opportunity to add and infuse kind of art, culture, uh, a little bit more of a character in the area. Um, so we're all looking at um, art, design, and aesthetic guidelines to help inform what it actually is going to look like. Again, all going to be subject to public input processes and things like that. Yeah, question? Is there a place for it to grab? Yeah. If I have a property there, you got to come and say, where are we modeling the street? Make it a double-decker, grandfather, whatever. Yeah, no, well, the city doesn't do that. Uh, we we rezone the land that would enable you as an owner of that land to do that if you wanted to. And if you don't want to, you're grandfathered in. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But if you see the economic benefit associated with that, you might want to consider it. Yeah. Parking is a concern. Yeah. might have a solution. The VFW building that goes, it becoming dilapidated or run down, it's an eyesore. Yeah. Hmm. That's a good suggestion. Um, we are going to be looking at, as a part of this entire uh, specific plan effort, we are going to look at strategically where to best place parking and parking garages. Uh, it could be that location. It could be another location. We, we don't know the exact answer to all that, but we're going to be analyzing every single one of those lots. Yeah. Every one of those parcels will be evaluated with those options in mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, the auxiliary, women's auxiliary and veterans park. Again, again, no, no, no. I mean, no, like, 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 it, good suggestion, good suggestion. Not here to discourage any, any comments, but. <laughs> we love the public comment. We're loving the public comment. Thank you. No, no, no. Good comment. Good comment. I don't know. I mean, I had lunch there the other day. I, I occasionally get part, you know, grab a lunch and sit under the tree when I need a little fresh air. But uh, that's what I sat on. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, it's a good point. You know, the, the truth is, is that um, are we getting the best use out of that park? I, maybe not. I don't know. But again, the premise behind this entire planning effort is to explore all of that, right? And yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And because it's kind of off of an alley, you also don't get a lot of car traffic either. You know, it's a lot safer. So let me let me move on. Um, when I talk about infusing art into the community, you may have seen some of these electric boxes out on the sidewalk. Well, we're looking to now undertake a program in the city. We actually did a call for artists. We got a lot of submissions from local uh, youth and artists in our community, right? We published this on the website, and we got some really good submissions. So that's something that's going to be coming in the very, very near future. Don't, no, no, we still have an opportunity. We have, I think, four phases to this whole program. So the idea is that right, we're targeting Whittier Boulevard because of all the activity that's going on with that Whittier Boulevard, but it's going to happen all over the city, right? Uh, no one's going to be left out on this. No, we cannot do ads. We don't want to do ads. Yeah, it's for the artists. Maybe we could do a digital screen and turn it into dynamic art, right? Where you change the art every so on. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, who knows? Who knows? 
that might require more maintenance. This is a really exciting project, guys. We, uh, as the city, um, we actually uh, purchased this property right here. That's on the corner of Lindsay and Whittier Boulevard, also in the heart of Uptown Pico Rivera. Uh, but with very intentional, uh, something in mind here, is the idea that this is going to become the headquarters for all things future Pico Rivera. And when we think about the future, who do we think about? The kids, right? So one of the things that we want to do is we are in the process, it's already, we're in the works, of partnering with the school district to establish what is called the Youth Ambassador Program, where we're going to expose them to all of these planning efforts. We're going to invite them. We're going to tie them to my hip and the professional consultant's hips so that they can start to learn about public administration, public policy, civil engineering, architecture, urban planning, transportation planning, right? Because we want to expose them to the tools of tomorrow. So we are going to undertake a very tech forward program, right? Where we're going to plan the future of Pico Rivera in this facility using virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D modeling, ArcGIS, urban footprint, AutoCAD, uh, the creative design suite from Adobe. It, you name it, we're going to expose youth and train and develop them so that they can get the skills they need today for when they're ready to take their job tomorrow. Yeah, this is the basically the new auto shop of the future. Exactly. Yeah, so we're partnering with, officially, we have established a partnership with USC with a graduate level course program. So we're going to have graduate students working with high school students, working with professional consultants. We're going to be slapping the name of the program on the whole thing. So yeah. Not seniors too. Or well, it's, it's, it's open to everybody. No, no, no. That's the primary focus, right? Because again, we're thinking about the future. But at the same time, we are going to have activities for all age groups. And we are going to have targeted uh, activities for seniors as well. Yeah. That is correct. That is correct. That is a part of the programming as well. Yep. So, so that's what we're calling the Idea Lab, right? The Innovation Design um, Empowerment and Action Lab, right? Very exciting opportunity for us as a city to b utilize this parcel of land for something that's very, very positive to engage them as part of the whole design process for everything that's happening in the city. Yeah. Oh, you know, funny you say that because we, we've, We've already uh, started lines of communication with major companies like Microsoft. Apple. With uh, <laughs> I can't do Apple. That's a dark side. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, no, no. But uh, we also Activision, which is one of the companies that designs all the uh, modern video games, right? Uh, so we're extending invitations for them to partner with us in this entire effort. Again, because if, if we are able to prepare the youth for the jobs of tomorrow, we want to be able to pr provide a pipeline into that workforce, right? So that way, we keep the talent born here in Pico Rivera in Pico Rivera, which helps us all around so many different issues. So, so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, this is, again, a slide that shows you about all the different investments we're making below ground. Because again, you can't make everything above ground nice until you do everything below ground, right? So we're enhancing water lines, we're modernizing sewage lines, we're uh, installing 10G fiber optic networks, uh, where we are literally going to have a fiber optic connection, 10G fiber optic connection to every single door, uh, every parcel of property in the city of Pico Rivera. That's incredibly uh, forward thinking. Yes, uh, you mean as far as undergrounding them? Yeah, yeah that's something that's up for consideration as well. Uh, phone lines, power lines. Um, yeah, it's, it costs a lot, there's no question, but there's also that long-term benefit associated with it. But um, we also have to work with the uh, electric utility and the company, uh, Southern California Edison, um, Prime also. Again, all of that is being evaluated as a part of this effort. Yeah. I don't know too much about that, to be honest with you. Oh, well, there you go. In that case, I need to talk to you. I live in L.A. I got to talk to you afterwards.
No, I'm kidding. All right, so we got about $186 million currently at work here in the city of Pico Rivera. Um, obviously, some of those investments are concentrated in the city, in the, along the Whittier Boulevard corridor with the eye towards leveraging the investment, maximizing the benefit for the community. So with that, uh, just a couple minutes over time, but happy to take any other questions or comments, concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Or it can, there's a railroad bridge that they just it's back then and stuff about it's not being used and we can find a way to connect that trail with the ten Yeah. Years. Yeah, so you may have heard that the city approved a big project on the parcel of land just on the other side of the freeway. Yeah, a big storage kind of distribution warehouse. Um and part of the condition for approval includes ensuring that they connect that bike path to the San Gabriel River. So, <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're trying to be, again, trying to be as holistic as possible. You know, I mean, of course, you're going to likely, um, you know, when you come from the Whittier Greenway Trail, you come up and over that bridge, you're going to be welcomed by a big building, but it's better than not having that, you know? Yeah. And the truth is, is we get to, you know, it, maximize the use of that space given the, the way it was zoned. You know, yeah. and so, yeah, so please keep sharing your notes. <laughs> <laughs> anything else, guys? Anything else? Happy to entertain anything else. It's just the idea how you think uh, community residents keep, uh, you know, in contact with the upstating and just with input from them. Yeah. 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 Let me talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, thank you. That's a great question. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So we, so as part of our outreach and engagement program, mind you, I must say we're also undertaking, not only are these, you know, planning efforts, you know, very forward thinking and something we've never really done as a city, but with that is something we've also haven't done as a city very well is the depth of outreach and engagement. This is the last town hall, but it's the beginning, barely the beginning. This is a series of three town halls. We're going to follow that by doing pop-ups um, at all of our special events. We got the egg extravaganza. We have a big block party coming up on Whittier Boulevard on April 29th. Mark your calendars. That's coming soon. Uh, we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to be at, at practically every and all events moving forward. We're going to host walking tours. We're going to have coffee with the planners and coffee with the engineers, and you know, but we're going to do a, a series of interactive activities. And then once the Idea Lab is open, that will be the space to really reimagine. And you can come in. It'll be an open door policy, obviously during operating hours. But the idea is that the community is always going to be welcome to come in and help us design a little nook and cranny over here or an entire back alley over there or what kind of architectural style do you like over here? Yes, question. Uh, oh, the uh, Idea Lab. It is. Triple Decker. We have a question from on the Zoom chat. Well, more of a comment. Uh, we have Alex Smith saying that he'd like to see more businesses like Brujeria come in. No one is going to the historic Whittier Boulevard for the Burlington Coat Factory, but I am excited for the changes as long as they represent our community. Thank you for that comment. Second question, has an environmental impact report been done for the Pad Park? Great question. Uh, no, we, we, we have not done an environmental um, clearance or analysis on it yet. That is something that is coming. Uh, we have only received, we received a million dollars to purchase the land. That was kind of like the first big phase of that entire effort. Um, and so that sale contract has officially uh, been executed, which is really exciting. I think that happened just late last week. Um, and then the next phase um, is to then go th deeper into the design of that park. When we get to about 30%, that's when we'll have enough information to initiate the environmental analysis. And then from there, we can then determine 
whether or not um, we'll have to do even deeper environmental uh, analysis to get uh, environmental clearance. But yeah, that that's a phase that's coming very, very soon. I want to say within within the next uh, eight to, to 12 months. All right. I will leave it with that. Thank you guys for joining the first series of town halls. We look forward to hopefully engaging you. Um, if you left your, your name and number or email, believe us, we're going to bug you. We need help for uh, reaching out to the community. We really want to just raise awareness about this. So hopefully we can uh, encourage more people to come out to the meetings. And matter of fact, don't leave it. Don't leave. Don't leave. I actually have a little something for all of you, a little yeah. gift cards that we're going to give out and everybody on the, on the line. So if you want to them, give me one second. I'll be right back.